It's time for my thousand mile review of the Aerial Rider Kepler because it's cold outside and it's a good time to work on this. If you've watched my videos you'll know that I ride a lot of rough roads with bad asphalt, gravel, sand, mud, and some creek crossings. And potholes, lots of potholes. By mountain biker standards, they may be pretty tame, but they're still enough to shake things loose, break things, and throw a rider off that isn't paying attention. So bike maintenance is pretty important if I don't want to walk home. I check the tire pressure before each ride, because I don't want any surprises, and I check the bolts now and then, and I've only had a few come loose. Once I found the front axle quick release was loose, but it was probably my fault. It might not have been seated well to start with. And once I found the rear caliper was loose, which was a surprise because all the bolts I have seen have had blue Loctite on them. I use white lightning clean lube or easy lube because I ride in a lot of dust and don't want a greasy lubricant that will attract dirt. I've only had one flat from a couple of thorns and it waited a few days to go flat in my living room. I bought the thickest tubes I could find, but they weren't much different than what came with the bike. But they're much thinner than those that I found for a 2.4 inch tire. So I've decided to put in some flat out, which lasts 10 years or more, which is a lot longer than most tire sealants. So keep an eye out for that when you decide on one. Since I ride on all sorts of surfaces, I prefer a tire that can handle pavement and off-road conditions. That was more difficult to find in a fat tire size than in other sizes. So far this Phoenix is the best one I've found with a center ridge that tracks better and rides smoother on road and has some good knobbies for off road. Unfortunately the Phoenix is about a quarter inch wider than other tires which would bring it closer to the chain if used as a rear tire. So I'm only using one on the front which I consider pretty important for steering. So far, the Origin 8 Supercell has been a good tire on the road and done everything necessary off-road. I might have put a Phoenix in the rear also, if not for the chain issue. I really like the fat tires compared to my 2.4 inch tires. They absorb a lot of bumps and float better on soft terrain. My bike is set up for long distance exploring, and while the Kepler came with a great battery, I still required a second battery for greater range. I carry tire repair tools, a small tire pump, and some CO2 inflators, and a critter stick back there on the basket, together with a fairly lightweight parang style machete. And if you don't have a skid plate, look at the dings in mine. It's no wonder they call it a cockpit. There's an awful lot going on on these handlebars. And I like the adjustable stem. My parking brakes come in handy. I have two other videos on that. I moved the pedal assist buttons over near the hand grip where I can reach them easier because I use them a lot. Here's a nice idea. A dropper seat post used widely by mountain bikers. It allows the seat to be lowered for conditions where you might want to use your foot for extra stability and don't need the extra efficiency of the straighter leg position. While you're sitting on it, pull the lever and your weight pushes it down. And then standing on your pedals, pull the lever and it pops back up again. There are remote control versions of this with a lever on the handlebar, but my handlebars are busy enough, so I thought I could get away with this simpler and cheaper one. The Kepler design is very similar to my old e-bike, which I've had about five years, but that was a 500 watt motor and class two bike that topped out at 21 miles an hour, which I don't feel is enough to get out of the way of cars on some of my narrow roads. But it was a great bike. I carried a lot of stuff on that luggage rack and took it places I would never take a regular bike, even towed my kayak. So my response to the Kepler is colored by my previous bike, but learning to ride the Kepler 
has taken a lot more time than learning to ride the other one. And that's mostly due to how the power is controlled and the Kipler has more power so it needs more control. And this is where I felt Aerial Rider missed the boat by not giving this bike adjustable PAS levels as most of their competitors have. So let me explain my old bike so you know where I started from. It had five PAS levels and a thumb throttle. The power to the throttle changed with the PAS levels. So in PAS 1, the throttle was a lot less sensitive, making it more easy to control at slow speeds. And the lower power of the bike made it more forgiving when you applied throttle or pedal assist. In PA0, the throttle didn't work at all. So it was an easy bike to ride and learn and was rather intuitive. Then we get to the Kepler and throw in a whole bunch more power. So any application of throttle or pedal assist creates a big surge of power and speed, which you'd better be ready for. And if you're in conditions where you need a lower speed and more control, that will cause you some problems. Oh, I'm turned down to 30 and 9 PAS levels, but... Let's go. So let's start with the PAS levels and what they are. They are really just preset throttle positions. If you're using five levels, level one is 52.5% of the total amount set by the speed limiter. So if the speed limiter is set to 58 kilometers per hour, which is about the maximum, Level 1 will give you 18.9 miles per hour on flat ground, which will be less on a hill. Pedaling slower does not give you a slower speed. It always gives you 52.5% of the power. Unfortunately, 9 levels is not significantly different, with level 1 providing 46% of the speed limiter setting. And while that helps a little bit, it still makes level 1 16.6 miles per hour, which is too much for difficult conditions. You can see that if it is set as a class 2 bike, level 1 is 10 miles an hour, which is a lot more manageable. Though I've been in conditions where 5 miles an hour was the appropriate speed, which is why adjustable PAS levels would make the bike easier to control. This lack of flexibility required me to reset my speed limiter multiple times per trip. There are two ways to change the speed limiter. The first is through the bike setup menu. Shut down the bike. Hold down the power key for three or more seconds until you go into the setup menu. There you see the maximum assist level, which can be changed on this screen. Hold down the menu key to get into the controller parameters. Push the up key to get down to the bottom instead of going all the way down. Push the menu key again to get into the speed limit. And use the up and down keys to change the number. Push the menu key again to get out. Push the down key to go back. And push the menu key. Push the up key once to go over to the back. Push the menu key and turn off the bike and then restart it again. This process is way too inconvenient for multiple resets per trip, so I usually use the BikeWise app. After installing the BikeWise app on your mobile device, you'll have to create an account, which is free, and sign in with an internet connection. The first time, you'll have to pair it with your bike using their instructions. 
once it's connected, it doesn't require an internet connection unless you shut down bike-wise, and then it requires it when you reconnect to the bike. So I leave it running during a ride. You'll see it's disconnected now, but I'll turn the bike on, and there it's already connected. And you scroll down to more settings, and there are various things you can change here, as in the bike menu, with the speed limiter at the bottom. The assistant level you see here is the current setting on the bike, not the number of levels you have chosen. Unfortunately, BikeWise only allows five levels of pedal assist and a maximum of 50 kilometers per hour. At the start of a ride, I usually set my bike to 58 kilometers per hour with the bike menu and then use BikeWise later as conditions change. Once I use BikeWise to lower it, I can only go back up to 50 kilometers per hour unless I use the bike setup menu. Although it says 50 on the screen there, the bike is still set to 58 until I change it with the BikeWise app. 50 is usually enough for me. Most of my roads can't handle more than that unless I'm heading out into traffic. this road. Yuck. That's my road down there. This is where it even Oh, that was creepy. I don't like that. As time went on, I found I needed a variable speed that I couldn't get out of the PAS settings, so I tried to learn to use the throttle as a pedal assist device. You'll see that on the twisty bike trails where there is no constant speed and conditions change from turn to turn. It didn't work well until I learned I had to turn the pedal assist to zero so it wouldn't interfere. Coasting, a lot of pedaling with and without power, and a lot of braking. The bike trail taught me I had to learn how to use the throttle better even though it's difficult to modulate. It takes the tiniest bit of movement to activate the throttle and more than you need creates a power surge. 
There are two things to know about the throttle. One is that it overrides the PAS setting, which you may have noticed going uphill with the PAS level, turning on the throttle causes a loss of power before the throttle actually kicks in. Then when the throttle is released, the PAS level kicks back in. The other thing is the speed limiter setting affects the throttle. The lower the speed limiter setting, the less power is available in the throttle and the less sensitive it will be. So you might find it easier to turn the speed limiter down while you're learning to use the throttle, or if you need a more sensitive throttle off-road. And that was the light bulb that went off for me. The throttle isn't just a throttle, it can be used as a variable pedal assist device as long as pedal assist is turned to zero. I have recently done some slow rides through the forest dodging branches and obstacles using only the throttle as pedal assist with the speed limiter still set to 58 and I got along okay. But it would have been better probably to turn down the speed limiter so the throttle was less sensitive. Moving on to other components, I like the Shimano shifter and how the downshift lever goes down through all of the gears in one stroke. So far it has always shifted smoothly for me. I like the 52 tooth chainring in front compared to most other bikes 48 which gives us better pedaling power at higher speeds. I have managed to keep pressure on the pedal up to 34 miles an hour, but often I don't move fast enough to go much over 30. The front suspension has been working really well on the rough roads that I ride on. It absorbs the bumps and is easier on my wrists and I think is working a lot better than my old bike. When I'm zooming down a long, fast hill, I'm very aware of what's keeping me alive, and that's the brakes. We may not be thinking of the heat being built up down there in the pads and on the disc, but it's happening nonetheless. So having decent components to start with and checking your pads occasionally is worth your life. Because we can't shift down to slow down and we don't have an anchor to throw out except ourselves. Gravel hills require brakes that can hold up to long application and not get grabby. Of course, loose gravel on a hill. That's getting a little steeper. And I'm throbbing the brakes on that. Don't want to keep them on, really. And like being slow ABS. Whoa, now that's steep. You probably can't tell, but that is steep. I'm down to oh, six, because anything else is going to be crazy. Slip back on my seat a bit. Ah.
almost down to the bottom at 35 miles an hour. I don't trust these roads. I did turn the camera a little bit there. It was pretty scary. <laughs> so let go of the handlebars. Got gravel at the end of this. Can't get too carried away. curvy hill with nice pavement. I'm cranked open as much as I can be. Slowed me down to 18, and I'm pedaling kind of hard in fifth. Mike is not invincible on big hills. like a long ride today. Oh, I'm going to be uh, 40 miles already on that thing. 41.47 miles on his speedometer. 40.3 on the bike. For some reason it's gotten closer. 39% of the battery. I've been working it pretty hard with all this wind. And I was going pretty fast. Here's some trip data from some of my rides with the miles per percent of battery power on the miles per amp hour. There's a lot of consistency here with some outliers caused by wind, hills, and how fast I went. I count on two miles per amp hour or less than one mile per percent and then I keep some in reserve. So I plan on a 60 mile range which allows me to keep some in reserve for headwinds and wrong turns.
Thirty-six and a half. That was on the GPS, but that was a little bit downhill. As I mentioned before, that 52 tooth chain ring helps us pedal at higher speeds than a lot of other bikes. I have pedaled up to 34 and a half, but I can't keep that up for long. small quirk that you may have noticed is that using the headlight button on the handlebar turns on the headlight but doesn't give you any indication on the display. Using the method described in the manual, which is holding down the plus key, turns on the headlight icon and dims the display but doesn't turn on the headlight. Here I'll hold down the plus key again which turns off the headlight icon and brightens the display. So if you want to turn on the headlight, push the headlight button and hold down the plus key to dim the display so it isn't distracting while riding in the dark. I mentioned this to Aerial Tech. They didn't seem to know it, but maybe they'll fix it in a later version. I don't ride at night much, so I can't comment on the headlight itself. There are others who have uh, gone into that in more detail. My brief look is that it probably is okay at slow speed, but at higher speeds I might want something a lot stronger. I have a handlebar mounted one, but I don't think I have room on these handlebars, so I'm not sure what I'll do. You may have noticed from my old bike pictures how much stuff was on the back there, which eliminates swinging a leg up over the back as you get on the bike. And that's why I chose a step-through frame both back then and now for the Kepler. I get on this bike like a motorcycle rider with stuff on the back. With my right pedal down, I step away from the bike a bit, lean it away from me, which is important to balance it better, tug the pant leg up, and put my right foot through the slot. Then I reverse to get off which also means I can mount it in places where I don't want to mount while it's moving. I also have the bike set to start up in PAS level zero, so moving pedals does not cause a surge. We each have our own needs for a bike and ride them in different conditions. Some people only ride on sidewalks and city roads. Some of them think first gear isn't necessary and PAS levels don't matter. Some of them don't even use the pedals. That is obviously not my experience in the places I ride. So how you use your bike obviously depends on where you're going to ride it. So let me try to summarize my response to the Kepler. I thought the 52 volt system would supply more power together with the 33 amp controller and the 20 amp hour battery all combined to make a more powerful bike. The 52 tooth chainring is important for higher pedaling speed. The brakes and shifter and other components were decent quality. I like the large luggage rack for carrying things as you've seen from my old bike pictures. The adjustable stem is important for comfort. I like the twist throttle better than the thumb throttle on my old bike, especially as how it is more important to control this bike. And I like having the BikeWise Pro app available, 
which unfortunately is partially making up for the bike's greatest flaw, which is no adjustable PAS levels. And supplied PAS levels that are only good for faster speeds. An improvement there would make this a brilliant bike. As it is, it is often kind of a struggle. But I have learned some methods to deal with it, but they took a long time to figure out. And I've had some great rides in some challenging places. Would I go choose one of the other ones even now? No, because I still like the things that I've mentioned. But it would be interesting to try some of them. But if you don't need those things, then other bikes are available with user-settable PAS levels that might make the bike easier to ride for you. Or you can just use the solutions that I found and be one step ahead of where I was when I got it. And there you have it. That's all I've got.